lasted until this afternoon, huh? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Little Johnny's kindergarten class was on a field trip to their local police station where they saw pictures tacked to a bulletin board of the 10 most wanted men. One of the youngsters pointed to a picture and asked if it really was the photo of a wanted person. Yes, said the policeman, the detectives want him very badly. Little Johnny asked, he said, so why didn't you keep him when you took his picture? <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes. Ephesians chapter 6. Beginning in verse 10. So with that scripture, how many of you know what we're talking about? Yeah. Oh, God. Well, those of you that aren't regulars here, you're, you're going to catch the end of the series. But that's okay. <laughs> Ephesians 6, verse 10. Starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And then the power of his mind. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day. And having done all to stand, Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication, in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Put on the armor of God. Today we're going to be on the helmet of salvation. So figuratively, take the helmet of salvation and put it on your heads this morning. All right? Have you done that? Three people have. <laughs> it's a good start. <laughs> when you suit up for battle, the helmet is the last piece to go on. That final piece of armor to have your battle ready. The helmet is vital for survival. Why? You're going to like this. It protects the brain, which is the nerve center. If the head is damaged, what happens? The rest of the armor is pointless to have on. So it says, put on the helmet of salvation. You know, when you start talking words like that, we start talking what I call churchese. You're talking church language. So what is this salvation that we talk about all about? We Christians talk about getting saved, and the non-Christians say, saved from what? From the world. A simple definition of salvation is being delivered from the power and effects of sin. Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31, the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas a question, and here it is. Sir, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. So you say, okay, I got that, Pastor. What do you mean put on the helmet of salvation? 
spiritually speaking, putting on the helmet of salvation provides hope. It protects the mind against anything that would destroy you. That helmet provides daily protection. I like that word protection. Why? Because when you become a Christian, are you ready for this? You have a bullseye pointed, painted on the front of your shirt. The moment you become a Christian, your name goes on a bulletin board in hell. Huh. And the more you do for Christ, the bigger the poster gets. <laughs> How many of you still want to be a Christian? <laughs> Good. I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm not trying to paint this horrible picture, but that's really actually what happens. Well, maybe not the poster in hell, but... The more like Christ you become, the more protection you need. The fact is the devil will fight you. He will oppose you in everything you do for the rest of your life. Aren't you excited now? Aren't you glad you came? Most Christians don't realize the longer you serve God, the more you need Him. And I will add this, the longer you serve Him, the more you want to serve Him. The more that we need other Christians, the more you need to pray, the more you need to read your Bible, the more you need to spend time in His presence, you will be tested and you will have trials as a Christian. But as you pass the test, as you grow in the Lord, you go to the next level in Him. And then you're going to go through another series of tests. And you're going to grow some more. Those tests prepare you for what's to come in your life. It takes a soldier trained Tested in battle to see the battle all the way through to the end. I want to be that soldier that has been tested, that has been tried, that is battle ready to make it through to the end. Amen. Your helmet. There are things you can do to keep your helmet in place, functioning well. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. Your mind is a battlefield. You can't help but see all kinds of garbage in your life as you're going through life. That garbage that is, is going to be filling you. And as you see something, a lot of times it begins to look like it must be okay because I see it all the time. Just because something is okay does not mean it's right. Just because society says this is okay does not mean it's okay in the eyes of God. Don't be conformed to what your society tells you is okay in this world. But be conformed in the image of Christ. Yes. Be conformed to what God wants you to be doing in your life. That's why this verse says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Satan uses a couple of things. One is called doubt, and another one is called discouragement. You hear those things all the time. What we need to do is reject doubt. We need to put discouragement away from our lives. 
How can you have faith and doubt at the same time? You can't. But we wrestle with that all the time. Here's an example of your helmets in action. Down in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. With faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How many of you like to get rewards from your parents as kids? You got rewards from your parents. How much greater of a reward to get from your Heavenly Father? How much greater of a reward can you have from Him? That's why we need to diligently seek Him. It's easy to have faith for the things you can see. And the, the common illustration is the chair you're sitting in. You had faith that that chair was going to hold you when you sat down in it. You have faith that when you turn the light switch on, it's going to come on. And you understand those things. It's easy to have faith for those types of things. I choose to have faith in those things I can't see. Like the scripture says. Let me use a very simple illustration of that. Somebody's sick. You pray for them. You have faith that God is going to heal. Amen? Amen. Have you seen it? Yeah. yeah. Hallelujah. Those types of faith is what I like to Go for it. The Bible says to resist the devil and he will flee from you. That is your helmet in action. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. And I have kept the, the faith. So everything I've shared with you so far is protective gear. You put them on. The belts, the breastplates, your shoes, and your helmets. The shield of faith is something you pick up, and that's one of them that we have covered already also. Shield of faith, you have to pick it up. It's something you have to use. You have to put it into action. If you don't pick it up, it's of no use. Next, though, is the sword of the Spirit. Also something you have to pick up. I was going to ask somebody if they wanted to pick up the sword right up front. But, oh, go ahead, Bob. Pick it up. That sword, if it's not picked up, is going to be useless. The sword of the Spirit is useless if you don't pick it up. Thank you, Bobby. It's going to stay right there. He tested the edge on it, too. It wasn't sharp. <laughs> so I, want to, I, I need you to help me out with this in just a second here. The sword of the Spirit, I want you to finish this sentence here. The sword of the Spirit, which is... Okay, now that you all know it, the Word of God. We're going to do it again. The sword of the Spirit, which is... The Word of God. John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Bible that you hold in your hands, or your cell phone that has the Bible on it. My cell phone's not... Okay, you, I'm not going to go there. The Bible that you hold in your hands is the written Word of God. There's a story in the book of Judges, about a man named Gideon. Probably all of you, or many of you, have heard that story of Gideon. Gideon was preparing to do battle against an army called the Midianites, who had 135,000 soldiers. 
Gideon only had 32,000. Gideon was ready to do battle in spite of the odds. Again, that is faith in action. <laughs> Gideon was ready to do battle in spite of the odds, but God had other plans. God told Gideon to let anyone that was afraid to go home. 22,000 men went home. How many does that have left over? Come on. This is not you math. There is 10,000 left. Follow me now. Do the math in your head because it's going to be a test here pretty soon. Then God told Gideon to have the rest of them drink from the spring. All of those who lapped the water like a dog could remain. The rest were sent home. Now, there's no math involved in this one, but how many were left? 300 men is what Gideon had left in his army. Surrounded by the Midianites that had 135,000 against 300. Now, Gideon's army was equipped with a trumpet, a pitcher covering a torch. How many of you would like to go into battle with those items of warfare. Now, come on. Don't, don't be afraid of me. It's good. Okay, answer me. How many of you would want to go into battle with just those three items? Mm -hmm. yes. No, of course not. On signal, they blew the trumpets. They broke the pitchers and shouted, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And the scripture says, God set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. And the enemy's camp was in chaos and defeated themselves. Now I want to tell you something here. Gideon's army had the armor of God on Many nights didn't. So obviously, Gideon's army is going to win this battle. And this story illustrates that it is God who gives the victory. It is God who gives the victory. His sword, God's sword, is what will deliver us. The sword is the only item listed by Paul that serves as an, in an offensive capacity. Even if we have all the rest of the armor on, and you go into battle without that sword, and remember it's the sword of the Spirit, if you go into battle without that sword, and you've got all the armor on, you might as well stay home. You've got to have the sword of the Spirit with you to be equipped perfectly. Now, here we go again. Without the sword, which is... Okay, come on. People, people. Without the sword, which is... Word of God. <laughs> you amount to little more than a heavily armored moving object. It is a sword and only the sword that allows us to attack. The Word of God. Psalm 119 verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word lights your path. Sometimes we wonder about the path we are on. God, why, why am I taking this path? Why am I going down this road? Why not this road? Someone said, I asked God, why are you taking me through the water? And God replied, because your enemy doesn't know how to swim. <laughs> 
Psalm 37, verse 27, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. Here's something else about God's word that, uh, that we really need to remember. It's found in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The sword of God's word can cut through anything Satan brings against you. Now I'm going to venture to say, or venture to ask another question, and I am looking for a response. <laughs> How many of you have ever gone through a trial in your life? No. Okay. Wow. wow. We've got a lot of honest people here now. <laughs> the sword of God's word can cut through anything Satan brings against you. When we are tempted in anything, we should follow the example of Jesus. And here's how. Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. So Satan said, All right, God, Jesus, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Jesus replied, That's good. But he started off with something different. As it is written. It is written. It is written. Amen. Thank you. It is, is written. Every time Satan tempted Jesus, he responded with it is, written. It is, is written. Each time. Satan tried on Jesus the same way he, he tries to get us. By putting doubt in our minds. To begin to get us to question what God can do. To begin to put doubt in our mind as to whether God can really do something or not. The one thing that I always tend to do is go right to the Word, the sword, with scriptures like this. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against you will stand. James 4, 7, submit yourselves to God and resist the devil. He will. It doesn't say he might. It says he will flee from you. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ. Thank you. You guys should catch on. You, get, you better be back next Sunday. I'll get you right here. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hallelujah. You need strength? It comes from the Word of God. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, Paul said, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed, we are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I already asked this, but I, I want to ask it in a little different way. How many of you, you don't have to lift your hands or say anything this time, but how many of you are facing difficulties in your life right now? Okay. Man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift my hand up. If you are facing difficulties, Paul said all of those things he has gone through, he has been hard-pressed, he's gone through so much. So much. But yet he's made it because he's put on the armor of God. He's made it because He's pressing on to the finish. He's made it because he hasn't just stood and let things come, but he's picked up the sword of the Spirit and he's gone on the offensive to take more territory, to put to defeat the enemy.
one thing I don't want to do is just stand still and let Satan just come at me and I'm just standing here. I don't know what I'm going to do. Life's terrible. I'm going to be defeated. No. I'm going to do like God did. I'm going to pick up the sword of the Spirit and I'm going to go on the attack. And I want to encourage you Whatever it is that you're facing today, whatever the trials are that you are facing today, you can be an overcomer. You can win those battles if you put on the armor of God. One of the things with the armor of God I want to encourage you to do is put it on daily. Don't just Put it on once in a while and then take it off. Say, Psh, I'm not fine. I'm okay. Put it on daily. Leave it on all day long. Put that armor around daily and realize, believe, expect, have faith, knowing what the scripture says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I get excited. Because you know what I do? I say, Satan, bring it on. Bring it on. And he does. So if you don't want him to bring it on, don't say it. But be ready. Put on the armor of God. I want to see Satan defeated. I want to see this community one to Christ. And it's not going to happen if we just stand still and do absolutely nothing. It's going to happen as we go on the offensive. We go on the attack. We take more territory in His name. Heavenly Father, thank You. Thank You, Lord. God, I'm strengthened by You and Your Word. God, I thank You that You've provided that armor for us to put on. You've instructed us to put it on. And Lord, give us the strength as we go on the offensive. And I thank you for that. I'd like every head bowed and every eye remain closed just for a moment. Many of you raised your hand. I asked if there's anyone going through difficulties in your life. I just want to see those hands one more time. Amen. Many more hands have gone up. Thank you. you put them down. Heavenly Father, we're victorious in you. We're on the winning team. I have read the end of the book, God, and you win. And I'm excited about that. God, I pray that each one that's here this morning understands that. And that we press on, that we fight on for your glory. And that we see more people come to know you as a result of that. And I thank you for that.